And again, it's not a meditation. It's, it's not a real self-effort where I'm just like, oh, I'm going to stop lusting. Oh, I'm going to stop being angry. Oh, no, 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 no. It's mm. a surrender. It's an acknowledgement that actually I'm incapable, kind of the depravity of man. Okay, fallen nature. God, I can't, I can't change this. You are absolutely right. This is here. I'm just going to hold it in your presence. I'm going to acknowledge it. I'm going to release it in your hands. And eventually there, there's a letting go, and then I can receive an, a deeper awareness of God in his presence. Now I can meditate on his scripture. If I'm doing a scripture meditation, I can really drink in the words of the scripture that I'm meditating on. Mm-hmm. I can become aware of, of an awareness of God's character or really drink that in his mercy, his love. Joining me today is Dr. Fernando Garzon. He is a licensed psychologist, ordained a minister, and a clinical outcomes-based researcher. He received his Bachelor of Arts in Biology at Wake Forest University and his Doctor of Psychology and Clinical Psychology from Fuller Seminary. Dr. Garzon then joined Regent faculty for almost a decade before a transition led him to Liberty University and their Clinical Mental Health Counseling and Doctor of Education and Community Care and Counseling programs. Dr. Garzon then returned to Regent University. His clinical experience has encompassed outpatient practice, managed care, hospital, pastoral care, and church settings. Dr. Garzon's research and writing focus on building an empirical base for spiritually focused protocols in clinical practice, exploring brief cognitive restructuring strategies, multicultural issues, Christian worldview pedagogy, and researching lay Christian counseling approaches in the church environment. Dr. Garzon, thank you so much for being here with us today. Well, thank you, Daniel, for having me. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Um, I've been starting these with Regent faculty with asking what it is that first got you interested in uh, in psychology. So if you Mm -hmm. could kind of maybe start there, that would be wonderful. Yeah, sure. So what got me interested? Part of it actually related to a career crisis I had when I was in college. So when I was in college, my, uh, my father's from Argentina, came here, kind of a pioneer story where he came here from Argentina, 50 bucks in his pocket. He became a medical doctor, graduated from Duke University, started a, a clinic, all of that in the Southwest Virginia area. And so when he had kids, I was the firstborn son, and normally, culturally, the firstborn son normally takes over the business Mm. for father. It's just kind of a normal thing that happens in many Hispanic cultures. And so I was, I always known what I was supposed to do since Mm. I was young. I was supposed to be a medical doctor. I was supposed to become internal medicine and take over the clinic. But when I was in college, I really became a crisis for me about my second year, sophomore year. I just started realizing, gosh, I don't know if I'm, I don't know if I'm really enjoying, I was a biology major, taking chemistry, all of this, mm-hmm. I was doing okay, making good grades, but I didn't really have a passion for it. So that sort of set off a sequence of events where I was like, okay, how do I do this with my, my family, with my father and everything? And plus, I don't know exactly what else I want to do. So basically, I, I kind of stalled him and stalled the family as far as making a decision when I graduated from Wake Forest, I decided, I said, uh, I'm going to work at a medical center first and just just get a feel. So he had an inkling, my family had an inkling that maybe I didn't really want to do this. So I worked there for a year, totally hated it. Uh, <laughs> people were great. You know, uh, I had friends who went to medical school right away at Wake Forest at Bowman Gray, and they loved it. Uh, but I was working in a lab and all around that. And I was like, well, I really don't like this. So it, it, it really was difficult at that time. Where it took me, though, was I really realized, you know, I, I want to help people. I enjoy interacting with people more than like sticking needles in them, taking blood, all of that stuff. Yeah. I, I feel like I want to do something more interpersonal. So Eventually, after my job there, I transitioned to a psych hospital. I started working at an adolescent and child unit uh, there in the, the Winston-Salem area and worked there, worked also in substance abuse there, adult inpatient. So I kind of rotated as a psych tech. But I, at that time, it was really nice because I could lead groups or co-lead them with the therapist. Oh. A lot of one-on-one time with the children. I did like puppet therapy, play therapy. 
I was doing all kinds of things that you would need more licensure type stuff to do, I think, right now. But the, yeah. the laws were a little bit more lenient then. So uh, I loved it. I just said, wow, I'm really enjoying this. And so eventually that led me to have some conversations with my father and with my family. Mm. And uh, over time, they, they came around to be supportive. And uh, then I ended up applying to uh, Fuller Seminary to their Graduate School of Psychology, their PsyD program. And in the end, I ended up at a good place with my family where I had their support and everything. But it was a crisis for a while and a growth period for me to really say, you know, this is really what I want to do. Yeah. It's kind of like I... You know, you go from having your map, your life all mapped out to to really kind of following God because faith was a big part of this as well. I was praying a lot and mm. really seeking the Lord's direction to say, God, I just don't feel your anointing, your your smile on me when I'm just in this medical center. Mm. But I, I did feel that when I was working with people in psychology. Yeah. And not not only is it um, you, you, ha you said you had your life mapped out and you were making that big change, but it's also, did you feel like you were not turning your back on your family? I know that over time they came around to it, but mm -hmm. did you feel like when making that decision, you were going against, you know, what your family naturally wanted for you? Absolutely. Yeah. Culturally, it was a big, it was a big deal. Mm. Uh, culturally for my family with, with my dad's Argentine roots. Uh -huh. And, and you know what really shifted it for him, though, was the time I was giving him talking about it mm. and the respect I was giving him uh -huh. that over time, while initially he did not like it, mm -hmm. he ended up supporting me. And I think part of that was when you think in terms of attachment-based theory, when you have two people who are differing and have like conflicting views on things, mm. reasoning doesn't really work that well to bring someone around to at least respect your side of the story or your opinion. Yeah. Having, a, having a friendship, having respect for someone and a friendship does. So I spent more time with dad just on non, not mm. talking about this, but I spent more time with him and eventually he could see I was making a mature decision. Mm. And then I think finally uh, the way I framed it was, you know, it, this, this will still bring honor to the family from a collectivistic type of perspective. Mm -hmm. I'll still be a doctor. I'll be a different type of doctor, uh, you know, helping people in a different way. But, yeah. but, you know, this won't be dishonoring to the family, you know, in, in the sense, you know, it's not like I'm totally abandoning things. So, mm -hmm. so yeah, yeah, it was, it was an important cultural shift and uh, it was a challenging one. But when I, I, you know, I learned and grew from it and God gave me the grace to do it as well, because it's not easy I could have easily just, you know, followed the map in a sense. But I think I would have probably suffered from a low-grade depression ongoing in my life yeah. if I would have. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's not easy. It's not easy, let alone if you were 15 and you thought, oh, I'm going to become a medical doctor. And then you started the college and then you had it all planned out. And then just making that transition on your own is difficult, let alone with everything else that you um, went through with talking to your parents about it and stuff. So that's good. Yeah. I'm glad that it all worked out. Yeah. Um, one quick comment on that yeah. too. So, so there was a lot of pain, which led me to realizing what, what I really wanted to do. And it mm. kind of fits with an act perspective, acceptance and commitment therapy has a mm. saying that uh, your pain reveals your values and your values reveal your pain. Mm. I think that pain told me that I valued something else besides mm. medicine. I really didn't know what it was at yeah. the time, but I found out what it was and I'm very thankful, very thankful to God for that. That's really, can you say the, can you say that again, the statement of the values? Yes. Yeah. So it's very common in, in act it, oh. is your pain reveals your values and your values reveal your pain. So, you wouldn't be depressed, for example, or anxious or struggling somehow emotionally with something if there wasn't something important embedded in that. Uh -huh. So for me, kind of the anxiety and the depression I was feeling, feeling stuck on a life map, that was telling me there was something more. I'm valuing something else. Hmm. And what that was is I, I value interacting with people. I value making a contribution that's more emotional uh -huh. than physical in terms of their health. I, it's a similar value, but it's different in that it's more of an emotional, spiritual contribution that I want to make. That fit my, the, my core personality and values better. 
Yeah, that's really neat. How, how would you tie that statement to the pain that your father might have been feeling? Yeah. So my father's values, of course, he had worked hard. He had set up, uh, you know, this, uh, this medical clinic, all of this. And so his values were to provide for the family and his values were to set up a good path for his family, for his yeah. firstborn son, for others as well. But it is more generally the firstborn son that, that, that you do in terms of that, that culture. Yeah. So for him, for his values, he certainly felt like he had fulfilled his role. Uh-huh. And so, uh, so he experienced or could have experienced a lot of disrespect in terms of my value choice. So that's kind of where he was coming from, mm. was, wait a minute, I've given all of this. What do you mean you don't want to do this? You know, what do you mean this doesn't, you know, yeah. uh, give you joy to be a, a medical doctor? So he came at it from that angle initially. But again, in terms of attachment theory, uh-huh. uh, I... Listen, I said, yeah, I know that makes sense, Dad. I totally get where you're coming from, and I respect that. And at the same time, I just, I, it's just not me. So, so, again, I tried not to argue with him as much as spend time with him and do things, and that enabled him to hear me. So mm. hopefully I answered your question. Did yeah. I answer your question? Yeah, yeah that was okay. good. Yeah. Okay. Um, so what, what, uh, what went into your decision for Fuller Theological Seminary? Yeah, for Fuller, primarily it was the Christian integration piece. I knew I wanted to be very well-grounded in terms of solid clinical psychology. Mm -hmm. And I also knew I wanted to bring my faith, my Christian worldview in it as well. Mm -hmm. So I'd been a Christian since I was 16, Mm -hmm. and I really wanted to see how faith and psychology connected. Mm -hmm. So that was a big big piece of it. Can you, um, I've talked a little bit about how Regent is a, is an integrated program. Um, mm-hmm. I don't know that I've ever explained what that means entirely and thinking that there's only maybe six or seven PsyD Christian integrated programs across the States. Can you yeah. kind of explain, um, maybe from a student's perspective and faculty perspective, what it is to be an integrated mm-hmm. Christian program? Okay. Well, wow. okay. So I'll try to explain it as if someone might be interested in a Christian integrative. Program. Yeah, that would be helpful. Yeah. So, so yes. Yeah, so what it is, so a Christian integrative program and all of them are actually really good. So there's like six, seven of them and all of them are really good. Normally what it does is it takes what APA requires in terms of training for clinical psychology. It does all of that. So you get the same thing that you would get in any secular program. Mm. But on top of that, you get a spiritual emphasis and especially a Christian spiritual emphasis where you take a look at the different subject matter areas and you ask questions like, does Christian theology, anthropology, and spiritual practices have anything to say about this area? So uh, when we talk later probably about my research, for example, uh, you know, I do a lot of research in the mindfulness-related area. Mm. And so that's related to meditation. Typically, that comes from an Eastern religious background. Uh, It's used a lot in clinical psychology now. So mindfulness, meditation, all kinds of things are used for stress and coping. And so uh, that's fine. That's good. You learn all of that here, right? You learn like you would at any university. Uh, but at the same time, we say, does the Christian worldview bring something into that? If I had a Christian walk into my office and all I knew was just straight, secular, or Buddhist mindfulness, mm-hmm. am I missing something? Uh, per, would a Christian perhaps be concerned? Perhaps there's some Christians that would say, wait a minute, is this some hokey new age thing? Or, or wait, isn't that from Buddhism? Mm-hmm. So uh, there's a real need to say, okay, is there a way to adapt these strategies to the Christian worldview? And that's something that's taken very seriously in most of these Christian integrative programs is this idea that you look at, okay, so psychology has this, this area. And uh, are there any things we can understand from theology that might be valuable? Or are there any things that we need to adapt to be culturally sensitive to a, a Christian as well? So in another area, multicultural area, for example, Right now, our nation's dealing with a lot in terms of racism, injustice, tensions, all kinds of things going on there. Well, is there anything that a Christian worldview could, could uh, bring there? Well, there's lots of things, right? So we're called to be peacemakers. We're called to build bridges. Uh, another thing is we have an understanding of the fallen nature. 
that mm -hmm. that racism is it's not just something that you learn in groups out groups socialization it is a capacity that every single person if they are put in the right situation in environmental context, they could easily become racist, they could easily mistreat others. Mm. And that's a product of the fallen nature, kind of at a deeper level, mm. which implies the, the importance of spiritual transformation, as well as all the other things we're doing to try to address these things, that there's a spiritual component that if you don't have a Christian worldview integrated framework, you're gonna miss if you're just mm. doing traditional multicultural psychology, uh, or multicultural counseling. So that's another example of kind of what Christian integrated programs do yeah. is they take the best, they take all the stuff you would learn at these other programs, but they really bring in a Christian worldview uh, approach. And what I love about region, and I can't say it's the same for all schools, but, but we try to be very concrete and practical about, about that. So uh, as, I, as I mentioned regarding mindfulness, regarding social justice or multicultural issues, the Christian worldview, the fallen nature, uh, you know, how we treat other people, uh, forgiveness, reconciliation, uh, justice, mercy, all of these things are very important in, in Christianity and, and are, are a meaningful contribution, I think, to the world now in terms of trying to deal with some really important stuff. Yeah, thank you. That was yeah, very well said. And I think a perfect segue into, can you tell us a little bit about your research team here at Regent? Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Sure. So I mentioned a little bit about mindfulness. And mm -hmm. so uh, one of the things that, that I'm doing, I'm, uh, uh, what I like to do there's, there, I like to produce research that will help uh, a non-Christian or maybe uh, another therapist from another worldview, mm -hmm. uh, a licensed clinician who's from another worldview who works with Christians to have resources that might actually help them work with their Christian clients. So we were talking about mindfulness before. Lots of people have training in mindfulness in the field, mm. but not many have, for example, uh, Christianity has its own history of meditation, like 2,000 years worth. Mm. You know, the Jesus prayer, hesychism, uh, you know, centering prayer, all kinds of things over the centuries, apophatic prayer, cataphatic prayer. But if I said, oh, you should try apophatic prayer with your Christian client, you know, my non-Christian or my, my other religious colleagues going to look at me like, <laughs> nah, I'm not going to do that. But if I said to my colleague, you know, that's great. You're doing mindfulness. Oh, you're working with a Christian here. You know, I have like a, a breath meditation that's adapted to the Christian worldview. Mm. I have some loving kindness meditations that are adapted to the Christian worldview. Would that be useful to you? Mm. Now, they would say to that, absolutely, yeah. because I'm speaking their language. I'm speaking mm. something that they've been trained in. Uh -huh. So what my research team is doing is we're taking a look at a variety of mindfulness strategies. We're integrating a Christian worldview to those, both in terms of how they're introduced to the client and in terms of the actual meditations themselves, so that a Christian client would feel much more comfortable doing those and feel like God is a, a, a very real part of those meditation practices. Mm. So they feel much safer. They feel much more religiously and culturally congruent for them. Okay. And so uh, we're, we also, I'll tell you, I've got a great team. My students are awesome. Uh, they are doing things like we're, we're going to do a randomized trial this spring, for example, mm. on on that uh, we've done you know we've done clinical cases we've done several pilot studies we tried to do a randomized trial and then covid kind of led to a bunch of attrition mm -hmm. so we had to to make those pilot studies but but my research team is great and what we're really trying to do is again build an empirical base so that there'll be some articles in the literature of research studies so that again my non-christian colleagues can like do a literature if they just put in christian mindfulness mm. i want them to see oh here's three studies mm. yeah by dr garçon's research team oh oh and here's an article where it describes the protocol oh i see oh here's the here are the scripts oh i can actually use this so again uh when i go to christian psychological conferences i can present this and and it's it's readily appreciated but it's also appreciated in the secular field, who is really, again, my target audience is not just the Christians. It really is uh, trying to make resources available. And I think that's just like if I think about it from another lens, uh -huh. I think it's the same as like uh, uh, my Muslim colleagues and my Buddhist colleagues who, who are writing articles to help 
help uh, non-Buddhist, non-Muslim mm. work more effectively with Muslims and Buddhists. I think yeah. I'm doing the same thing for, for Christians, trying to generate research to do that. Yeah, that's really neat. I didn't know that your target audience was actually toward the secular psychologist and trying to bridge that. So that's really cool. It's neat to find out. Yeah. 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 I um, actually used, I was using ACT with a client and I came across, oh, you actually referred it to me. Um, mm-hmm. AJ, part of your research team, they, they developed uh, with ACT, there's leaves on a stream and they developed yes. kind of a leaves on a stream Christian version. Uh, and there's a video on YouTube. I'll, I'll actually link it. When I post mm-hmm. this video. So yeah, that was really helpful. And my client loved it a lot. So. Oh, great. Yeah. Great. Yeah. And you know, I've got some audios if you want to, uh, I can send you some audios of some other, other meditations as well. So yeah, that, yeah, that's great. great. Fantastic. Um, there is, I was, uh, we were at church a few weeks ago and the pastor was talking about, um, Within, within one of the Psalms talking about meditation, and he said from the pulpit, you know, um, meditation nowadays is about emptying your mind, but in the Bible, most meditation was about meditating on God or on scripture. Um, mm-hmm. is that, is that, does that fit with, with what you have found? And when, can you kind of describe to me more about that? I think it's providential you're asking this question. It's a great oh. question, it comes up a lot. And uh, I would say, it, yes, it fits. And there, there are some subtle things that actually I don't think people realize when they say just that. So mm-hmm. number one, I agree in general. Yes, Christian meditation is about filling. However, there is an emptying to mm-hmm. Christian meditation. So I'll give you an example. So, okay. um, so for Christian meditation, and, and, but it's not realized, but I know if I explain it to a pastor who kind of makes that statement, then they say, uh-huh. oh, yes, okay, I agree with that. Uh-huh. So, for example, yes, Eastern meditation focuses on just kind of this, this emptying, and then you just kind of sit in this emptiness or this nothingness. Very fits very much with Buddhism, Hinduism, mm. trying to connect. In Hinduism, you're trying to connect with the sense of consciousness or kind of uh, pantheistic, you know, God everywhere. I am a part of God, kind of merging with God. Mm. Uh, Buddhism, attaining enlightenment, achieving nirvana, no desire, nothingness type annihilation of the self so those are kind of the paths that those are the telos of buddhist meditative practices which if someone really got into it even if they were just using it for stress and coping sometimes if you really get immersed in that you might actually have experiences that start mirroring those goals of Mm. that which Uh which is something so but anyway so all right so it's not just an emptying just to be empty in christian uh, meditation but you are trying to empty in a different way. If, if you think of emptying in a Christian sense as, for example, releasing things to God, surrendering things into God's hands, letting go of things. So, for example, uh, my pride, my lust, my anger, uh, you know, my self-centeredness. When, when I am quiet before the Lord, when I, am, when I am meditating, many times I become much more aware Mm-hmm. of these reactions in my heart, just kind of how self-focused I am or, or how worried about image or what it, whatever. Uh-huh. And I'm like, when those come up, I'm like, you're right. Mm-hmm. And I don't, I don't have to get in a big, oh, God, forgive me and beat myself up. But in, in, in contemplation, what you're doing or in meditation is you're just handing those over to God. Mm-hmm. You're saying, you're right. This is here. This is me. Without your grace, this is where I am and this is what I am. You're right. I just kind of agree and I just hold it and just release it. I let it go. So there's an emptying. There's an emptying of uh, sinful attitudes and things, not by me with my self will trying to change those or beat myself up or argue with that, but just kind of acknowledging that and just leaning on grace and just releasing that. So again, there's that emptying. Uh, as I empty that, maybe I'm worried about things. Maybe I'm afraid of some things, you know. So again, just a surrender of those things into God's hands, resting in his presence. And now, now that I've let go of all of those things, all right, now I can actually, I can receive mm. what God has for me. So there's, there's an emptying, uh, perhaps you might call it an emptying of my carnal desires, my fleshly patterns and sinful attitudes and everything. And now I can receive of the spirit, his grace. So that when I explain it that way to a pastor who makes a statement, like you just said, then they Uh will agree with me. 
Oh, okay, yeah, that type of emptying, yeah, I can see that. And again, it's not a meditation. It's, it's not a real self-effort where I'm just like, oh, I'm going to stop lusting. Oh, I'm going to stop being angry. Oh, no, 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 no. It's mm. a surrender. It's an acknowledgement that actually I'm incapable, kind of the depravity of man. Okay, fallen nature. God, I can't, I can't change this. You are absolutely right. This is here. I'm just going to hold it in your presence. I'm going to acknowledge it. I'm going to release it in your hands. And eventually there, there's a letting go, and then I can receive and a, a deeper awareness of God and his presence. Now I can meditate on his scripture. If I'm doing a scripture meditation, I can really drink in the words of the scripture that I'm meditating on. Mm-hmm. I can become aware of, of an awareness of God's character or really drink that in his mercy, his love. Uh, so, so yes, if, if that helps you any, the way I, I define Christian meditation in a sense, it's, it's, um, it's focusing on, on God or different aspects um, in order to enhance, you know, an awareness of God, to enhance um, my ability to love my neighbor or myself, and sometimes for emotional healing. So there's different, different aspects of it, but there is an emptying process and a receiving process. It's just qualitatively different. I'm not just emptying myself to get in kind of a nothing state. Uh-huh. I'm emptying myself to let go of, Things so that I can receive from God, that God is always with me. And so I'm not just emptying myself to just be alone in silence. Yes, I'm, I'm in silence, but I'm in the presence of God. And that's what changes me. Mm. And that's good news. That's part of the good news, part of the sanctification process. Yeah, yeah. No, that's really, I've never, I've never thought that much into detail to it. So a few things that came to my mind is one, when uh, I think it's David in one of the Psalms says, search me and try me. And yes. Um, see if there be any wicked way in me, and and what better way to kind of do that than to just kind of sit and be still and try and kind of almost you know um, have no thoughts or empty your mind and see and and pray even you can maybe even start out and pray that search me and try me see if there be any wicked way in me see what comes up and then hand that over and then um, and then dwell on on maybe scripture and and then fill fill now that now that that's out then fill it with something good and holy and true yeah yeah that's That's beautifully stated that's beautifully Uh stated because what i find is when i quiet myself before the lord Mm. that those things naturally pop up Mm. it wasn't like i said okay god i'm going to sit here and i'm going to deal with my anger today Uh no what will happen is i'll start thinking about things that i'm angry about (laughs) okay (laughs) and then i'm like i'm sitting here in god's presence thinking about this stuff and I'm like, okay, yeah, Lord, you're right. That's there. And so they just naturally bubble up and we hand them over to God. And then normally he will show me what, what is next. Is it, is it contemplating his mercy? Is it meditating on scripture? This is where being led of the spirit mm-hmm. is very important. It's like he will show us kind of the next step. Or, you know, sometimes you do a very structured, scripted meditation. Great. That's good, too. You, you can do that. Um, but then there are these other times, again, where there's this kind of emptying process, and then the Holy Spirit leads, and he'll always lead you into biblically accurate and consistent things. He wouldn't, and that's another thing. You're always, another difference between, like, Christian meditation or, uh, and uh, non-Christian practices is we, we're always, uh, juxtaposing our experience with scripture because Mm. scripture interprets our experience. So uh, that's why another question, there's a question that I train my students to ask in in spiritual assessment. For example, I always ask my students, yes, you you talk about their church attendance, Bible study, or or their religious practices, but it's always good to ask Christian and non-Christian clients, you know, have you ever had a disturbing spiritual experience? Mm. Uh, because, you know, sometimes there's uh, occult activities, there's things people play in video games and things they don't even realize they're kind of messing around with witchcraft sometimes. Mm. And so people can have pretty scary experiences because the, there's also a dark spiritual world out there too. And so it's useful to have that, uh, to have your client share about that. And so, so that's important. And in meditation, too, sometimes uh, someone could have uh, both a weird spiritual experience, and so if they're not like like comparing that with scripture, they might just kind of go down a, a, a very 
dark path, or they might, they might think, oh gosh, you know, what's going on? Now there's another angle too. So I've talked about kind of regular, talked about the, the kind of, you know, dark spiritual. Uh, then there's the other thing that can happen too. You know, what if you suffer from PTSD? Meditation can be very helpful for people with PTSD. But if you haven't been aware of some of your pain, sometimes that can pop up too when you're meditating. Mm. And so this is where, again, the, our field of, of Christian integrative psychology is very important. And so someone might need to actually go see a therapist if they were meditating and all of a sudden they started having a flashback of like a painful childhood memory or something that they mm. couldn't process. Well, then you need to get in therapy and really, really evaluate what's going on. And it could be you need some PTSD treatment. Mm -hmm. So hopefully you see now, now that's generally rare. The research is, is really that meditation generally is a safe practice for over 90% of people. It's, it's normally a very, very low risk, but sometimes you can have a reaction and you would need to go see a therapist. And I would want that to be a, a Christian therapist if someone was doing Christian meditation to help them sort through, yeah. uh, you know, do they need some good clinical treatment for uh, some emotional pain, maybe some painful memories or things that they need to have resolved. Yeah. Um, do you, are you, I don't know how that, so your colleagues, a lot of, do you, are you in contact with a lot of Christian psychologists? And if so, do a lot of them, are they, aware and do they practice the same type of christian accommodated uh, mindfulness and stuff like that some do uh, -huh. uh some don't some it's just not a uh, an area of their training i i love my christian colleagues i i learned so much from mm -hmm. my colleagues so uh so for example trauma work right there's such a huge field there's so many people doing wonderful work so i learn a lot from my colleagues both christian and non-christian in terms of how to how to work with trauma yeah uh you know so what i find is typically my christian colleagues some will focus on different areas so let's say attachment for instance mm -hmm. some wonderful work um you know todd hall others doing fantastic work on attachment and applying you know christian principles to that both in assessment and in terms of god attachment and other things so so i think that a lot of times christians have different there's a wide variety of christians out there practicing psychology so uh -huh. some do it kind of like i do with uh -huh. christian accommodated mindfulness others have other areas that they're really strong in that i'm learning from mm -hmm. uh and then, then some, again, kind of have like what you were saying, kind of that pastor's quote first, that you just stay away from this stuff and you just, you just focus on filling the mind rather than emptying. Mm -hmm. um, so some are like that too. So. Okay. So it sounds kind of like you're, you're talking to different theoretical orientations in a way. Um, yes. Can you explain your own theoretical orientation? Yes. Okay. Uh, certainly. So <laughs> I approach things in terms of, of uh, an attachment framework overarching because I really attend to the therapeutic relationship hmm. and the relationship of that person with the Lord if they're a Christian client. So it's really there's, there's three per people in the room. It's, it's a triadic thing hmm. if that person is a Christian, God is present. I know the Holy Spirit is present whether I'm working with a Christian or non-Christian, hmm. but it's a very triadic awareness in terms of attachment if I was working with a Christian. And out of that flow, I tend to use a lot of third wave cognitive therapies. So ACT is one of my favorites. Uh, dialectical behavioral therapy is another one that is very useful. Of course, I use different mindfulness type things. I don't limit myself to that. I certainly draw, I use interpersonal psychotherapy a lot with depression when someone has uh, grief you know, uh, role transitions, et cetera. Yeah. And so I'm flexible in terms of using evidence-based treatments, but I, I conceptualize from an attachment framework mm -hmm. and I tend to lean if, if everything is equal and my client is responding well, I'll tend to do third wave cognitive therapies with them if they're responding well to them. Okay. You, um, you seem from the last few years that I've known you, you are very, it seems you seem very naturally inclined to um, just like the therapeutic relationship and establishing good rapport and a good solid like relationship with your client, with people, with students, with 
you seem very um, just collegial and friendly and kind. Is that something that you've, did that come natural for you? Or is that something that you've worked on over the years? Is that, um, yeah. Yeah, you know, that's a good question. So, mm -hmm. yes, I'm, I'm thinking in terms of my early development. So in my early development, like when I was a kid, like uh -huh. 10 and below, I was getting into fights all the time. Wow. I was, I was kind of a, I was a terror at school. I was, <laughs> I was not fun. So, mm -hmm. so I think if you had a snapshot of me then uh -huh. to now, yeah, there, there's been quite a bit of, of change in that. Now, at that time, too, uh, lots of things, right? As a psychologist, I know, you know, my parents were having a lot of arguments and things. Mm -hmm. I was displacing a lot of anger. I was getting in trouble at school, you know, all of those things. So there were a lot of things going on there. And I think when I became a Christian at 16, they, I wanted to handle anger differently. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to... Right away, it was like God showed me that, you know, you're hurting your neighbor. You're, you know, mm. you're, you're treating people unkindly. And so I think at that point, uh, I would say I had some attachment issues at mm. that point, just from all of the family pain and things. And so it, there was this process that began. At that point, I, I had a, a good, healthy church environment. I got into wonderful Bible study, some good friends. So I think I started developing some attachment relationships with some spiritual mentors mm. that started developing in me uh, what I would describe as a, a healthy, earned, secure attachment. I didn't start out securely attached as a person. And when I say that, for those who don't know attachment theory, basically we have different relation, relational styles. And I would say at that time I had what would be called an anxious attachment style. So I was anxious in relationship, fearing rejection. Um, uh, I might do things to produce rejection you know, at that time. So, so uh, an anxious attachment style has problems with closeness and feeling comfortable and relaxed in that. So, mm. but over time uh, with these good Christian mentors and things, then my own therapy experience, I always tell my students, I encourage them to have their own good therapy experience, preferably with a good Christian counselor, psychologist, mental health professional, Who's, who's really good and that you really feel like you're getting help from, that can really do just as much as any of your training. Actually more, I think. I think I learned more from that than, than anything I experienced at Fuller. The, you know, don't get upset with me, Fuller, if you're watching this, but it's, you know, <laughs> it's just true. Yeah. It's just true that your own personal experience really does help. So, so that, I think, I think that was more of an earned secure attachment byproduct of my relationship with the Lord, mm -hmm. good mentors, some good therapy. So, um, yeah, yeah. And I'm thankful for that. So I'm, I'm really grateful if, if people feel, you know, like I'm trying to connect and be kind, then that's true. That's what I want to be. So that's yeah. great. If that's happening. Good. Um, I wanted to ask while I had you, if, if you've run across, um, in your years of being a psychologist, a uh, Christian psychologist, is there certain areas in the field that, um, Christian psychologists might need to tread a little differently um, in order to kind of, I don't know, stay afloat or stay out of trouble or um, maybe unique challenges to Christian psychologists? Yeah. Yeah, that's a really good question. There, there are some challenges right now, I think. Um, I think, for example, if someone's watching this video and is thinking about becoming a psychologist, or perhaps going into another helping profession. I think mm -hmm. one of the challenges in our field right now is it's really important if you're thinking about Christians and being a psychologist, Christian psychologist, uh, it's really important in practicing in just professional licensed billing insurance type of settings. It's really important to know the difference between being a psychologist and being um, in pastoral care, mm -hmm. uh, being a pastoral counselor or being a pastor in those settings, so I'm, I'm evangelical at my heart. I, I want people to know Jesus Christ. He has saved me, transformed me, and I want everybody to know him. Mm -hmm. At the same time, when I'm operating as a psychologist in a secular setting, and I'm working with people from different backgrounds, uh, uh, you know, uh, non-Christian backgrounds, different lifestyles, other things, that 
that I, that's not a place where I can impose my values or I can, you know, I can preach the gospel, for example, and those I need to do good clinical work. I need to, to help them recover from their depression or their anxiety or whatever they're dealing with, their addiction, whatever they're struggling with, using the best, the best treatments that are evidence-based that we have from science, I certainly can pray for my clients. I can certainly do what's called implicit integration in terms of caring for them, showing them God's love and how I care for them. Mm -hmm. But I can't really evangelize them. I can't really impose my worldview on, on them. I think that's important for someone who's thinking about psychology and they're a Christian, a devout Christian who, who really wants to change lives. Mm -hmm. You can change lives, but, but you're, you can't really uh, introduce the gospel in a very overt sense for someone who's not a Christian. Now, there may be some settings where that's, there's a little bit of a gray area, like if I was practicing in a church counseling center, mm -hmm. there was an agency-informed consent where they said, you know, this is a Christian counseling center. We will, you know, uh, you know, part of what we do is we ask some questions about your spirituality, if you're open to talking about it, all that, just be aware. That the, you know. So there's some informed consent processes that might give a little bit of a gray area if you're, if you're in a church counseling center, uh, certainly, if you were operating as, you know, I'm also, you know, uh, you know, a uh, licensed, an ordained minister. So if I was operating just as a pastor, that's a different role. But I think it's real good if you're thinking about psychology to understand as a Christian, yes, you can certainly help Christians. You can talk about scripture. You can certainly uh, do a lot of things there, but you're going to be limited with people who are not Christians. And you have to make sure that really fits. If that's okay with you in terms of your values. Um, uh, you know, whether you can do that. So that's one thing. I think another thing that's interesting, I think this for the field of psychology, I think that there's this question now what to do. So there's been an increased emphasis on diversity, very important, very needed mm -hmm. to be culturally sensitive to different, uh, different backgrounds, uh, faith, lifestyles, all kinds of things that that the field is is really recognizing we need to be multiculturally sensitive. So that's that's great. However, I think the field is still sorting out what is the role of religious conscience, hmm. both in terms of as a psychologist. What about psychologists who have a religious conscience about certain things and certain, uh, you know, can they work in certain areas, that sort of thing? Yeah. What about clients who have religious conscience about Things. So if I'm working with a Muslim client, for example, mm -hmm. a conservative Muslim client who, who says, look, uh, you know, I'm struggling with uh, same-sex attraction and I, you know, uh, I want to stay connected to my family. I realize if I just live a gay lifestyle, my family's going to reject me. Mm -hmm. And so, so the field, I know there's, you know, some nice work by Mark Yarhouse and some others in terms of how to help people with intersecting identities, right? Their faith mm -hmm. identity, their sexual orientation, things like that. We need to compassionately and sensitively deal with those things, provide good, good care, not impose values, mm -hmm. et cetera. However, I think, I think the field in, in the push to appreciate diversity and to really make sure to be inclusive mm -hmm. The question is, can we be inclusive of, of clients who, again, have different lifestyle values and things based on their faith? What, what do we do with mental health professionals who have uh, religious conscience and things? Yeah. And, and why is that important? Because there has been kind of a push. It feels like to me, I've seen some literature where it seems like there's some things, you know, how can psychology help people? Uh, you know, become more tolerant. So if, if you define that to me as being compassionate and respectful for people who have differing values and lifestyles than you, I'm all in. That's uh -huh. great. Uh -huh. But if, if you're talking about like maybe convincing someone who as part of their faith says, I really, I really don't want to practice this lifestyle and, and somehow trying to get that person to change their mind or something, hmm. I think that's, that's dangerous. And I'm not saying psychology is there or doing that, but it feels like by, by trying to make sure that uh, people from a you know, lesbian, gay background feel comfortable, safe in therapy. Yeah, I'm all for that. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. They need to be, feel comfortable, safe, accepted in therapy. Mm -hmm. All right. And also who needs to feel that same way is people with a religious conscience who have real core values 
to not feel like they're going to go to a therapist and maybe the therapist is going to try to change those values, mm. that they can actually have those and feel like they can get good psychological treatment and recover from their anxiety and depression. And again, I'm not saying that's happening now as much as I'm saying, oh, it feels like there might be a danger there where, uh -huh. where it's set up almost like a forced choice. Either you provide good care for one group of people and, and, and you know, uh, or you provide it for, for the other. Now, we can provide it for all of them if we do good work. And so psychology can certainly help people, uh, I think, help society become less racist. Certainly all of that. Psychology is good for helping. Uh, I want psychology to help, you know, to end discrimination. I want people to have opportunity here. That's great. Uh, what, what would make me nervous is if it starts where we're heading down a road where communism, for example, in communist countries, hmm. uh, if you don't agree with a p certain political viewpoint or mm -hmm. something, uh, you might get in a state hospital and the psychologist there, and you can look up the records in history if you want in terms of how the Soviet Union, the old Russia, used to use its psychologists, they would work with people to try to make them communist mm. or to try to change them politically, their values, to try to change them in other ways. So now you're making me really nervous uh -huh. if we're starting to say we need to use psychology to start changing people's long-held, cherished values that are not harming other people, right? Mm -hmm. Obviously, if someone's harming other people, I'm all, yeah, let's, let's work with that. That's, that's harming other people. We don't want to do that. But religious conscience, if we're saying, you know, because that's what they did in the Soviet Union. Yeah. If you were a Christian in China, you're a Christian, you're thrown in prison, or you might see a psychologist, they, they want to intentionally change what you hold very precious and valuable. Mm -hmm. And that would make me nervous. We're not doing that. But we could. Mm. We could. It is not a forced choice. We have to make room in diversity for people of all sorts. Uh, we've improved in terms of, of respecting different lifestyles and things. You know, can we respect religious conscience? That's yeah. really important. And I can see where we might, when I look at kind of some of the wording of things, it's, it's almost like we're trying to give, I could be wrong, I hope not, mm. but I'm like, are we trying to give psychologists the privilege of identifying you have an incorrect belief that's harmful mm. in society and I'm going to actually try to change that in my work with you? Uh -huh. Or, you know, there are a few that could be harmful, right? Child molester believes that's fine. I don't believe that's fine. No, no. that no. But if someone has a, a religious belief or value, uh, you know, it, it's my, my job to respect that and, and to provide good treatment. So, mm -hmm. so I hope we don't go down a slippery slope that the Soviet Union, that communist countries do, where they use psychology to intentionally change mm. a person's value, deeply held values, and to try to uh, brainwash them in a sense. Mm. And I hope we don't go that, down that path. We're not there. We don't do that now. But I certainly hope we don't because it feels like Religious conscience, I still think we're sorting through how to work at that with that as a field. I yeah. know that was a long answer, but actually I think that is a big area right now. Yeah, um, something like that, I don't think it can be answered shortly, and it shouldn't be. And it makes me, it makes, you talked about wanting everything, everyone to be inclusive and tolerant. Um, and, but I, like you said, well, I don't, I'm not going to say that you said this, but... Um, it makes me think that if you're not, if you don't agree with us, if you're not, then if you're not as tolerant as we are or as inclusive as we are, then you're wrong and then you're outcasted. Like, and kind of, that's how right. You need to change or something. And I'm like, no, wait, hold on, hold uh -huh. on, wait just a minute, be careful. Be careful. There's, you know, we got to be careful. We've got uh, a lot of religions that have very specific. In terms of the conservative, there's all sorts of different types of Buddhists, Muslims, Christians, mm. Jews, etc. Okay, Hindus, mm -hmm. all of that. But there are many in almost each of those camps who have very specific lifestyle values. Mm. And they are well-intended people who want to retreat, who actually want to treat everybody with respect, including people who don't live by their lifestyles. Mm -hmm. They're not trying to impose them, uh, but they just don't want to feel like 
they're being imposed on in, in a way that, that makes them live out values that would conflict with what they really believe. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. So, so, uh, so that's just an important, mm. important thing I think for us to sort through. Is there room for everybody, including religious conscience, you know, people who have, because you can have a religious conscience and not be a bigot not be a homophobe, not be a racist, not, you know, you can have a religious conscience, but some people might not assume you can, you know, some people may feel like you can't. And that's where I think psychology is sorting through and can be very helpful Mm -hmm. for us to be what I would call genuinely diverse. Genuine diversity means not everybody's going to believe like it. Not, not everybody may be as, as quote unquote inclusive as I might feel they need to be, yeah. But they may also not be racist. They may not also, not also be discriminatory. They yeah. may not also be homophobic. They just have different lifestyle beliefs. If they can respect these other beliefs, you know, they're not going to try, try to harm anybody or to force anybody to do anything. Mm-hmm. Then I don't, I'm hoping that uh, there's room enough in the psychology practice so that we don't try to, again, uh, impose on them. Yeah. Uh, do you have any uh, books on on the psychologists during like the Soviet Union and stuff like that? You know that that would be great. It's it's not a uh, a really good area uh-huh. for me in terms of my scholarship. So I don't necessarily have a book. Yeah. Uh, you know, actually, I'd probably consult with my colleague Dean Ord. You know, Doctor Ord okay. uh, has she's. Uh, from Russia. She has a Russian background, so she may actually be able to be a resource for that. But but yes, when you look at the way the Soviet Union used their psychologist in their state hospitals and things, mm. it was to bring people around to a communist perspective and mm. to intentionally change their views. If they had political views that, that opposed, uh, opposed them, they, they certainly would use psychology in a very brainwashing sense to wow. to stop any sort of political dissent hmm. and um, you know we've had you know we've we've had debates in our own country in terms of the CIA and you know whether psychologists you know participating trying to get information all of that what is the role of psychologists that is ethical in that what is the role of psychologists that is unethical in that so uh, so it's always been a challenge for psychology I think to evaluate what is the ethical practice of psychology because Mm. psychology can be used to manipulate people, can't it? I mean, you know, it can be used to be incredibly helpful and it can be used to manipulate people in a very negative sense too. And sometimes it's the scariest if we think we're using it, we're justified in manipulating people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's, that is, that's where we get on scary ground where we think we're right, right enough, to intentionally manipulate and brainwash when someone's not harming other people, when mm-hmm. someone just simply has a different, a different value or a different, different viewpoint. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Very well said. Um, I don't think I've ever asked you about your being an ordained minister. When did that come about or how, yeah. When did that come about? Yeah. You know, that came about actually, um, First time I was at Regent, and uh, I was actually just praying, you know, Lord, what would you have me do here? And so when I was, actually, I was born and raised in Southwest Virginia, there weren't really a lot of Latinos there. Mm. And here, though, there were a whole lot. And so I basically started interacting with some friends, and I started going to uh, a little Latino church and just just enjoying that. Mm. And uh, they it's wonderful. I, you know, they, they just started pulling me in. I was speaking some, and then I'm doing more of this, more of that. And and then at that point, it just felt right to go ahead and to become ordained Mm -hmm. so that I could practice as an associate pastor. Okay. And uh, so that was helpful. It also, I didn't realize it at the time, but it also is helpful in terms of, of my practice what I do now, because if I want to, for example, I could practice in a church setting as a pastor in a pastoral role or as a pastoral counselor. And I've actually done that in the past where, for example, 
I'll work with people, they'll come into me and I'll say, look, and a lot of times I'll counsel with my wife and she's a better counselor than I am, by the way. <laughs> listens, empathy, just, it's great. She's awesome. No degree, but she has an honorary degree from me. But, okay. but we'll, sometimes, for example, we would counsel in the church and when people would come to us, we re really wouldn't counsel. I shouldn't use that, that term. We would, we would do ministry there, pastoral ministry. Mm -hmm. So we would clarify, uh, I would clarify my role that, that I'm there operating in a ministerial sense. And if in our conversations, it, it looks like it would be appropriate for them to get some mental health care, mm. that I would refer them to one of my Christian mental health professional colleagues who would help. So if, if there was an, a problem or something where it was clear, it was, it was beyond what I felt like should be, should be handled in terms of pastoral care, mm -hmm. you know, then I would refer them. So, so in that sense, actually, it has been helpful because it's given me some different avenues. I will say also, it's been an honor because I interact more with pastors as well. So it's also given me some credibility there because they're like, oh, you've been an associate pastor. You know, some of our needs, you know, what we're, what we're about in a sense. And yeah. so there's a little more of a, a respect and a, 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 a trust factor there with them than I would have if I was just a clinical psychologist. Mm -hmm. And again, it kind of fits some of my evangelical thing. I need to preach every once in a while. And so yeah. it's kind of good to get in the pulpit and do that. <laughs> good. Um, last question. Um, you've been here at Regent for quite a while. You came, you left, came back. Where do you see your, do you have any, I kind of know, maybe like short term, long term goals and where do you see yourself in maybe the next 10 years? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good question. Good question. So, I take it actually a year at a time. Every year, okay. there's a point in the year. So it might be December, might be September. But there's a point in the year where I will do some fasting and prayer. And I'll just ask, you know, Lord, what, what would you have? Mm. So I'm very comfortable here. I love region. I'm very, very happy to be here. I'm very happy to serve here. I've never sought positions like the current academic position I have in terms of administration and things. I wasn't looking for that. So people, people, I just look to serve. And so where if someone has a need and they talk with me and say, Hey, can you help with this? Or I think you'd be good at that. And we really need someone there. Then I'll pray about it and I may do it. So as far as my goals, I guess my number one goal is uh, to serve God and to, to be an active part of his kingdom in the place that he would have me to be and being the person he would have me to be. Mm. Number one, I have to be a person he has me to be. And so that kind of relates back to some of the Christian meditation and things, the different spiritual practices that I want to do to reflect Christ's character. Yeah. Uh, however imperfectly I do that, and I celebrate uh, uh, God's grace to do that when it happens. So that's the number one over the next 10 years is, is to, to convey Christ's character. And I think the other is, again, to be flexible. So, so I'm all for goals and things like solid, like, oh, I, I plan to do this, that, you know. Uh -huh. You know, I have goals for research. I'd love to, to complete a couple more randomized trials on Christian accommodative mindfulness. And then we'll see if God wants me to move on to something else to, to research and explore. Uh, so I have some goals there held loosely. And then also here, I'm, I'm happy to serve here. I'm hoping to serve here for another five, 10 years would be wonderful. Good. Uh, uh, and at the same time, I'm, I'm flexible in the sense I just take it a year at a time mm -hmm. because I, th I think if I just get in what I would call a, a rut where I'm just kind of, you know, the, not even thinking that God might have something else for me, mm -hmm. then I might miss something. Mm -hmm. I might miss something because people, if, if my goal is security, then that's not the kingdom. <laughs> that's, that's not the kingdom. The kingdom is following God, yeah. you know, yeah. and there's security in following him, but the security is not in just having a, a job that's secure or, you know, having insurance or having enough money to pay your bills or, or whatever. So, so yeah, so my goals are not operationalized, if you want to use that term, <laughs> where there's like a concrete, it's, uh, it's flexible service, uh, in the kingdom of God. That's, that's what I want to do. And I love it here. I'm happy to stay here. God wants me here for 10 years. I'm happy to say yes, Lord. And, and to do that. And, uh, I do, but I do take an intentional time every year to just reflect and just be open 
not just to assume, but just be open every year. I mean, that's how I ended up here in this position I'm in right now is I just, you know, people ask me and I prayed about it. I never, again, you know, I, yeah, never sought it. Here I am. So who knows where I'll be, what hat I'll be wearing five years from now. So. Spoken like a true minister. Yeah. And it, <laughs> that's right. and it ties back a lot with, um, you know, part of the reason you got into psychology in the first place was you, you stopped what you were, you, did, you didn't really aim for security. You stopped what you were doing and you listened and then you shows a different mm-hmm. path. So it fits really well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. My life map is no map. <laughs> nice. That's, that's my <laughs> <laughs> I like it. All right, Dr. Garzon, this has been a, a huge pleasure and I'm glad that we had this conversation and um, thank you again for joining us. You are very welcome, Daniel. Thank you for having me and God bless you and all you do. I appreciate these podcasts that you're doing. Yeah. They're really enriching for everyone and it's a really valuable service for, for the whole community. So thank you. Thank you.